responsible for reviewing brain tumor issues, advised against the approval of aspartame. Under the watch of the new FDA commissioner, Arthur Hull Hayes, the panel lawyer assigned a new panel member to eventually achieve a 3-to-3 split over aspartame. On July 18, 1981, Arthur Hull Hayes overruled the Public Board of Inquiry to approve aspartame for use in dry foods. Furthermore, the FDA impaneled its own panel to review the Public Board of Inquiry. Three of those people were assigned to review the cancer part of the Public Board of Inquiry, the part that said you can't market it. Those three scientists, every single one of them said, we agree with the Public Board of Inquiry. These are three FDA senior scientists. We agree with the Public Board of Inquiry. They met with the commissioner the night before he announced that he was going to approve NutraSweet and begged him not to approve NutraSweet. Animals that just ordinarily do not get brain tumors. And this should have been enough to have invoked the so-called Delaney Amendment to the 1958 Food and Drug Act, which says that if something causes tumors or cancer in experimental animals, you should not approve it for human use. In 1983, the FDA approved the use of aspartame in carbonated beverages. Under charges of improprieties, Arthur Hull Hayes left the FDA and was hired as a consultant for $1,000 a day by G.D. Searle's public relations firm. NutraSweet or aspartame is the most studied food ingredient ever approved by the FDA, and not just by the FDA, but by more than 70 regulatory bodies around the world. In order to rubber stamp it around the world, you've got to get it approved another, in another country. Okay, so let's take Europe. If England were to find out that they wanted them indicted for fraud, if they ever read these reports by the CDC or uh, the FDA Board of Inquiry saying it's not safe or found out, you know, about the, that they wanted them indicted, naturally they're not going to approve it. So what they did was uh, Searle, the manufacturer, made a business deal with a professor, Paul Turner, who was in the regulatory agency in England, and he approved it without anybody knowing it. Parliament had a big blowout about it, and the story was in The Guardian. I have a copy of it, but they did not rescind the order. There were no studies done in the U.K., and it was uh, rubber-stamped then around the world. They could say, well, it was approved in the United States, it was approved in Europe, and then it was approved, you know, in other places. Uh, they used to, they tried to get it approved in Canada, and they couldn't do it. But once they got it approved in Europe, they began to rubber-stamp it around the world. The American Dietetic Association, the American Diabetes Association, the American Medical Association, goes all the way down the line. And if you were to see and read their journals and publications and see who the sponsors were and the people who were paying a great deal for advertising therein, it would make a little bit more sense. But, but the Center for Disease Control did an investigation and said it was safe. No, the Center for Disease uh, never said it was safe either. What they did, here is the Center for Disease Control Investigation. And uh, it's a 146-page document. What it goes into, what was happening to the people, goes into cardiac arrest, it goes into seizures, it goes into liver problems, it goes into mood alteration, and it goes into death. And it ends up by saying that more neurological studies need to be done. Now, here's what happened. If you go to the Center for Disease Control website, uh, you will see a summary, not this 146-page investigation, but a summary that contradicts this report, saying that it was just mild findings. And I told Dr. Satcher before he left the CDC and became Surgeon General, I said, if you don't take that phony summary off, I will put the whole 146-page investigation on web and let the world see what the Center for Disease Control did. And we do have it on www.dorway.com, like doorway with one O. You can read this entire investigation, and this is the original document. 
Betty Martini and her organization, Mission Possible, have served as a lighthouse for people who suspect their toxin to be aspartame and wish to learn more. For over 10 years, she has worked tirelessly to inform people of this issue, often challenged by the pharmaceutical and food industries. Mission Possible is the central hub for prevailing knowledge of aspartame. Betty Martini and Mission Possible contribute to Doorway.com, a website that is likely the most frequently cited Internet source on this issue. A substantial find in my investigation was Betty Martini. Her work is an act of charity, and her sources are credible. And, of course, as the case histories came in on the Internet, and they were just coming in so fast that one day I got 12,000 case histories of people suffering from aspartame and crashed my computer. So uh, four support groups have been set up on the Internet to take care of these people because finally they wondered. They'd been going from doctor to doctor. They read that, and uh, they realized why they had MS. They realized about lupus. They realized about diabetes. Many of them called just hysterical, crying, you know, could this be true, could this be true? But as they got off, their MS symptoms disappeared. People that were blind could see again. Now the current philosophy within the Food and Drug Administration is, let's go ahead and we'll approve this food additive or whatever is in here, and we'll let the people prove that it's dangerous. They were calling the uh, FDA. They were calling the hospitals, the doctors. They were calling the CDC. I got one email from the CDC and they said, you know, people are calling over here. They're hysterical about this. I said, well, whose fault is it? You did the most damning investigation ever done. I said, and then you put this phony summary up there. Instead of, you know, you should be doing what I'm doing. You know, you are the Center for Disease Control. And we're having to alert the world, you know, because you people sold out. And then you, then you get up with this very terrible equation that says, well, if this thing only harms one in a million people, we'll consider it to be safe. Now, harms, they say kills. If it, if it kills only one in a million people, the FDA considers it to be safe. So what you have then by, that, by virtue of that is you're saying that as far as we're concerned, something that kills between 200 and 300 people a year, we consider safe. That doesn't work for the 200 or 300 people. And so if you're going to do that, you better have, a pro, better have a label somewhere that says safe means we'll kill no more than two or 300 people a year. And I, I, I want to pose that to people because I've had a conversation with some other federal regulators. And I said, you know, with all the technology we have today, with all the advances in medicine and science, people are getting sicker. Has, has anyone noticed that? Uh, people are, are buying more pharmaceutical drugs to, to cure the very things that these chemical companies started to begin with. So I'm thinking from the womb to the tomb, you're going to be paying money to these pharmaceutical companies, and they're going to be manipulating the politics so you get to consume all of their poisons, all of the toxins, things that are totally untested. And we're going to see five or six years from now people coming down with new kinds of diseases, things that we never even heard of today. You know, you have to take some responsibility for what you're putting in your mouth. But in this case, they have no way of knowing. They got the FDA lying to them. They got the CDC, the professional organizations. They go to the doctors. The doctors can't help them because they've been lied to, too. Doctors only know what they're taught, and they only believe what they're allowed to believe. So I think it was the year 1917, but I could be wrong. Somewhere in that era, they developed the electrocardiogram. The year before... Indigestion was the number one cause of death in the United States. The year after electrocardiogram was invented, uh, myocardial infarction was the number one cause of death in the United States. So a lot of doctors are still back in, on the NutraSweet issue. They're, they're still way back in the era before anybody allowed them to know there's anything wrong with it. So many of these things are prolonged effects, and of course if a physician sees it, and, they see a, a child with a seizure, uh, they're not going to connect it to the MSG or aspartame because they don't know about this research. They're not familiar with it. Uh, they'll just tell the mother, well, I don't see how that could be related, you know, something you drank when you were pregnant. So 
fast forward, you know, from five and a half years of no aspartame, very little MSG, being very careful of what I eat when I go into restaurants, um, totally realizing that I can't have these kinds of things, I checked into the hospital on March the 23rd to have a full knee replacement of my left knee. Had a great surgeon, very confident in him. Was a little, um, a little nervous. You know, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't. Hospitals and doctors have processes in place to try and protect us. When you check into a hospital, they ask you, well, what are you allergic to? What, um, what kind of food allergies do you have? Number one on my list now, five and a half years later, is always aspartame. By now, most doctors do know what aspartame is. I don't have to explain it to them. There was a time when I would have to explain the artificial sweetener, NutraSweet, equal that, that's in Diet Coke's Diet Pepsi, Diet Crystal Light Lemonade. When I came out of the operating room, the first four days, I would say, I really don't remember very much of it. Yes, I had aching. Yeah, I had the usual problems that doctors prepare you for. What, what I didn't expect is I was sick. Yes, I hurt, but I was physically sick. And I'm trying to contribute that to uh, the anesthesia, some of the other drugs that they may be giving me for pain. I actually walked with a walker to the shower, and I'm sitting in the shower, and all of a sudden I realize I'm going to faint. I am sitting down. And the next thing I remember is I wake up and there are a lot of people in the restroom with me, a small restroom, and there's this big giant red machine facing me. A lot of people and the nurse is here and she has taken her knuckles and she was doing what she let her describe to me as a sternum rub, left bruises on my chest. But I can remember she was doing, and I can remember feeling how much that hurt. But, and I didn't know why she was doing it, and it took me a few moments to realize where I was. But she let her explain that a sternum rub is to, to cause me to start breathing again. In her words, what happened is, I was sitting there, and she said, my eyes rolled back in the back of my head, and then I quit breathing. So there was a code blue. Can you define exactly a code blue to me? What I understand, and I don't know why they call it a code blue, but that's what the nurse uh, explained to me happened. The fact that um, I quit breathing, evidently that constitutes a code blue. I don't know if that means my heart stopped. I'm not quite sure with the sternum rub that she was doing when, when I came to, she said that was to cause me to start breathing again. Um, the hospital wasn't very helpful uh, during this entire time. In fact, following the code blue, and that's what the nurse called it, and that's what all of the, um, the other patients were referring to it as, would you believe a hospital staff, they never discussed this with my husband? They never told him what happened. Uh, I had to tell him what had happened. It's almost as though they tried to say that either it didn't happen or it was insignificant. Four o'clock in the afternoon, my therapist was putting me back in bed and putting me into this machine that for knee replacement, they put you in what's called a continuous motion machine. And she was hooking me up, and one of the volunteers that work in the hospital is rolling her cart up and down the aisle with some snacks on it. And she comes in, and she says, how about some snacks this afternoon? I said, well, it depends on what you've got. She says, well, I've got some cookies. And says, I have some diet crystal light lemonade. And I looked at her, and I said, you don't have crystal light lemonade on your cart. She says, oh, I do. I really do. I said, not diet crystal light lemonade. She says, oh, I do. And she says, you don't have to worry about it. She says, because there's no sugar in it. So I'm looking at my therapist. Her name was Tina. I said, um, Tina, I would like for you to contact the dietitian. So Tina had the dietitian fax up to me the label for the lemonade that I had been getting. And you'll see crystal light. 
sugar-free. And if you continue to look, of course, it has the phenylalanine warning on it. It's sweetened with aspartame. That was all the proof that I needed. In addition, she confirmed that the same lemonade that is on the cart is the same lemonade that is in the kitchen that is served to all the patients. That's where I realized I was getting poisoned. Don't know if you've been in the hospital lately, but what hospitals do now is every patient is given a menu. And a couple of days in advance, you're allowed to go in and you're allowed to select menu items. Well, all I ever drink is water. I was sick of water. So every menu, I would circle down here, beverages. It says lemonade. You'll notice it doesn't say sugar-free. It doesn't say diet. It was just lemonade. It wasn't very good lemonade. It was made from a mix, but I assumed it was sweetened with sugar. I never dreamed for a minute that I was getting diet crystal light. Every day for lunch and every dinner, this is what they were serving me. Once I realized that, uh, this is my last menu from my last supper at Mission Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Once I realized that, I knew exactly why. It seemed that after my meals, I got a little worse, got a little sicker. Uh, typically, I would have some gastrointestinal problems. Still didn't associate that, again, with, with aspartame poisoning. Once I realized what was happening, everything made sense. So I called in the, the head nurse. I called in. I said, I want you to contact my doctor. I'm leaving the hospital, and I'm leaving right now. By Within 18 hours, as best I can remember right now, it seems like the first thing that corrected itself is my vision started coming back. I could at least read by that point. It took... I would think about three weeks. Evidently, the level of aspartame that I had been given during that time was enough that it was so concentrated in my organs, my tissues, that it took about three weeks for you know it to completely get out. I'm probably looking at a knee replacement for this right knee. My surgeon says, um, wait as long as you can. And I'm going to be very honest, I'm scared to death. I really am. I'm terrified to go back into the hospital. Yes, I might be able to avoid the aspartame again, but I'm concerned about all of it now. I don't, I'm not confident that the nursing staff and the doctors are going to really take care of me the way that I always thought they would. We're about ready to meet Diane Fleming, who was convicted of murdering her husband by methanol poisoning. Her attorney neglected to mention that uh, he was a big her husband was a big consumer of aspartame products, and aspartame breaks down into methanol and could have uh, been the cause of his death rather than her. That's a possibility that was never brought out in court, and therefore she got 50 years in this prison. Um, so we're about ready to meet her and hear her side of the story. Um. Describe your husband to me. Tell me what he was like. Well, he was he kept he kept himself a lot. I don't think a lot of people knew him real well. You know, he didn't want to socialize with people at work or anything. He was very driven at work. Like he never missed work, even the, the morning in question when he got up sick and he's saying, "Oh, I feel terrible," but he went to work because that's what he did. We had a weight machine, we had a stair climber, we had a treadmill, and he read everything he could find about how to, the right way to do weights. He started reading about creatine and said that he wanted to try it, and he talked about it for a while beforehand. And apparently what it does is it pulls the muscle, it pulls water to the muscles to pump them up more. I was wondering exactly what it was. Yeah, that, you know, that doesn't sound like a good idea, messing with the fluid balances in your body, pulling water from one place, you know, putting it someplace else. But, uh, and I think it had something to do with the recovery um, time. And he wanted to try that. We picked up some Gatorade. He was trying to decide what to put it in because 
you could mix it in, they said water or fruit juice, but water probably wouldn't taste too good, and he didn't drink fruit juice. <laughs> so he said, well, maybe Gatorade. You know, he kind of tasted it, see how it tasted, and then set it in the fridge, and went to the pool with our daughter, and came back, and well, then he played basketball from about four until seven with the guys, mostly some guys from church, and they would meet at the middle school, and came back and drank that. Even when he came back from playing ball, he wasn't feeling good, but it was very hot. That month, that summer, it got hot early. Even in May and early June, it was really hot. It, you know, and he always felt lousy. Called an ambulance, and he was showing some signs of maybe being a little bit disoriented, but he was still talking and everything, answering the questions. The paramedics thought, kind of what I did, that he was dehydrated from throwing up so much that his electrolytes might have been out of whack because they said, well, we need to get some fluid in you and get some electrolytes. And um, his breathing was real fast. They, you know, tried to get him to slow his respirations down. They said he was hyperventilating. And they thought that was a lot of his problem. And they put him in the ambulance and, you know, transported him. And about, after we'd gotten out of our neighborhood and into... And through the other neighborhood, and we were um, still kind of going on the back roads, they turned the lights on, and that kind of scared me. When they, because there wasn't traffic, it was, um, so we were crossing over the lake. They turned the lights on. But I called his parents in after I'd um, done all the paperwork. You know, they took him on back, but I had to give them the insurance information and everything. They eventually called me back there. And he was still conscious, but he was way incoherent. You know, he wasn't making any sense. And he was real, like, wanting to get up off the gurney and everything. And, and they finally had to give him some Ativan IV to calm him down because he wouldn't stay, you know. And what's that? Ativan is, um, it's in the same family as Valium. Um, wound up putting him then in the MICU, Medical Intensive Care Unit. By the time he got up there, he wasn't really conscious anymore, but then they had pumped him full of Ativan, too, so it's hard to say. You know, I don't know at what point... Really? <laughs> I'm not on cell loft anymore, so... <laughs> I don't know at what point he really went into a coma, you know, and when it was the Ativan. I know that night um, I mentioned to him that he wore the extended wear lenses, and even though you sleep in those things, you know, the, the nurses don't usually like for patients to have them in. I know they make you take them out. Usually that's one of the things they ask you, and I brought it up. So they said, well, would you take his lenses out? You know, and, and he, he kind of responded to that, you know, like whenever I was trying to remove his lenses, which is really hard to do on another person. And early the next morning, the doctor called and said that they'd already gotten the toxicology back, which they weren't expecting that for a long time. They said it would take, you know, a couple of days, which sounds kind of bad. And they said they'd gotten it back and they found methanol in his system. The treatment is to infuse ethanol intravenously, and then your body, instead of working on the methanol, it kind of leaves it alone and works on the ethanol. That gives them time to try to use dialysis and stuff to get the methanol out of your system. Well, they kept saying they weren't able to get his blood alcohol level up enough. And even though they were taking into consideration that he was a drinker, you know, apparently drinkers, you know, you can handle more alcohol, your body works with it better. So they, you know, gave him more than what they would have a non-drinker, but they said they weren't, didn't feel like they were able to get his blood alcohol level up enough. So they, but they were doing the dialysis, um, 
I think they start him on that the next, the very next day, I believe, the second day. They start him on the dialysis. But, you know, he just wasn't responding at all. He just, you know, like I said, they, you know, then they, they decided he was in a coma at some point, I guess, because after the Ativan wore off and they weren't, and he still was unresponsive. They um, did a CAT scan and said that he had suffered a major <laughs> that he had suffered a major brain bleed. <clears throat> a brain bleed and the size and location was such that he, he said no, no one could survive that, even if they were successful in getting the methanol out of his body. That because of the the bleeding in the brain, that, you know that wasn't. So they started talking about discontinuing life support, and you know. He, we talked about it. Um, that was on that Wednesday, and you know, they kept assuring us that there was no way, even if they kept treating the math and all, that because of the brain damage, that there was nothing that could be done. So I wanted to wait until the next, give it another day. Well, I was the one that called the police <laughs> that morning, that Wednesday morning, when Dr. Akers he called me before I got there. You know, it was before 7.30. I was getting Megan ready for school. He said, we think this may have been a poisoning, an intentional poisoning, and you need to get the police involved. I'm like, how do I do that, you know? So I said, okay. Even though we, that afternoon before, you know, the decision about removing life support, I met the police. They asked me to come back to the house so they could look for possible sources. The specialists that have looked at it now said that the amount of diet drinks that he consumed would easily account for the levels of methanol that he had in his body. I think drinking the creatine just kind of must have pushed it over the edge, you know. Um, adulteration of a substance and first degree murder. And the jury. Um, gave me 20 years on the adulteration and 30 on the murder, and the judge ran them concurrently. We're all human, you know, people are human, and people like to believe that 12 people on a jury found her guilty, so she must be guilty. No way, you know. I mean, I, I have argued that since day one, and I still do not understand what those people could have possibly heard in those testimonies. You read the transcript. What could they have heard that could possibly have convinced them that Diane Fleming could have killed her husband? I included Diane Fleming in my journey because chronic methanol toxicity from aspartame was not considered at all in her case. Instead, they chose to prosecute her for supposedly pouring a sealed bottle of blue windshield wiper fluid into Gatorade to poison her husband. While there is no way that I can definitively state the precise or exact cause of my own condition, I did drink six to ten cans of diet soda per day for twenty years, and when my body told me to stop, I eventually got better. I can also state that I have spoken to health care professionals who agree with me that aspartame is a probable culprit. When I first embarked upon this journey, a part of me was expecting to return empty-handed. What I uncovered, however, was that the current measures of food safety are failing us. So what do we do today? We just drove. <laughs> and drove and drove. And now we're going to drive some more. What would you say to the makers and manufacturers of aspartame now if you could? I think they owe me a fortune. They owe me an apology. But they owe me a fortune. I live on Social Security Disability. I have nothing left. I'm very heavily in debt. I am trying very hard to start my own business. But that in itself takes money that I don't have. So I'm doing it bits and pieces as I can. 
but a after that, I mean, just each day was just better and better and better. And I'm still finding things that it's in because they don't label it very well, and that is very, very aggravating um, because you have to read each label. And I've got three kids and everything, and I don't have a whole lot of time to go spending a year and a half in the grocery store to do a week's worth of groceries and reading every label that I get my hands on. I've been into chat areas and talked to people with multiple sclerosis and they're very, very hostile to people like me. So I don't tout it too much. All the while I've learned that uh, there is a very safe uh, sweetener that's an alternative to sugar called Stevia, S-T-E-V-I-A. To this day, the FDA will not allow Stevia to be labeled, advertised, or promoted as a sweetener. It cannot state that. It's just an alternative food supplement.